Joy Patricia Hayward was born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland, and attended Annapolis High School, where she was a cheerleader and a member of the drama stage crew. She also practiced ballet for many years and then graduated from Salisbury University. While in college, she worked as a nanny and volunteered for the Humane Society. She was also very active on campus, participating in several student organizations. Joy graduated from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in 1999 with a bachelor's degree in psychology and was going on to earn a teaching certificate, hoping to become a teacher like her mother. She left before completing the program and moved to North Carolina with her boyfriend, Michael Lett. Mike was a Marine and was transferred to Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, where he and Joy would share a home together. In 2004, Mike was given a temporary work assignment at Boeing in Ridley Park, Pennsylvania, so Joy had been staying at her mother's home in Annapolis, Maryland. On February 11, 2004, Joy drove from Maryland to visit Mike in Pennsylvania. But after arriving, the couple had several drinks and then got into an argument. Joy grabbed her cell phone and her car keys and took Mike's cell phone for some reason. Joy then went to the Days Inn Motel on Providence Road in Chester, Pennsylvania, an area often known for its high crime rate. Joy was most likely unaware of the town's violent reputation. She checked into the Days Inn shortly after 1.30 a.m., but didn't go to her room immediately. It's unclear where she went, but she returned about an hour later. It's possible that she left to get more alcohol, as some was later found in her room. The desk clerk also recalled a man walking behind her who rode the elevator with her. At 3 a.m., Joy called the desk clerk and told him she needed assistance. He asked her what kind of problems she was having, and she said she needed him to come to her room. But the clerk explained that he couldn't leave the front desk, and Joy hung up. There were no further calls from her, and the desk clerk never attempted to call her back. The next afternoon, a maid entered room 605 to clean it and tragically found Joy's unclothed body in the bathtub in six inches of water. Joy was pronounced dead at 4.50 p.m., and her death was ruled a homicide by strangulation. When investigators scoured the room, they found nothing that would indicate a struggle had taken place. The door to the room had not been forced open, leading police to believe that Joy had known or thought she knew her attacker and had willingly let him into the room. Her clothes were still folded neatly on the bed, and there was a bottle of alcohol and two glass tumblers on a small table. Floating in water inside an ice bucket, crime scene technicians found two cigarettes, one Marlboro and one Newport. They collected all the evidence and sent it in for further forensic processing, hoping it might lead to the killer's DNA. Joy had been physically attacked, but it was unclear if she had been indecently assaulted. The hotel had no working surveillance cameras, but the desk clerk provided detectives with a description of the male seen getting into the elevator at the same time as Joy. Investigators believed this was the likely killer, but they were still interested in questioning Joy's boyfriend. Mike cooperated with the investigators and told them about the argument he and Joy had gotten into before she left. He admitted that she had been very angry, but was adamant that he had nothing to do with her murder. Neither of their cell phones was found at the crime scene or in her car. Technicians were able to retrieve DNA samples from the glass tumblers, the cigarette butts, and several areas on Joy's body. It was determined that all the DNA belonged to the same person, but that person was not Mike, and he was ruled out as a suspect. Unfortunately, there were no matches in the CODIS database. Detectives were hopeful that they would be able to solve the case quickly, but as weeks went by, they found they were hindered by the code of silence that ruled the streets of Chester. Although they were certain some people in the area knew exactly who was responsible, no one would agree to speak with authorities. On June 22, 2004, Joy's killer struck again. A 44-year-old woman was waiting at a SEPTA bus stop only a few blocks from the Days Inn at 7 a.m. She noticed a male on a bicycle who kept cycling past her. He eventually got off his bike and approached her, telling her he had a gun. Scared into submission, 
the woman was dragged into a thickly wooded area in a nearby park. The man then indecently assaulted her and attempted to strangle her until he heard the sounds of people approaching. Scared, the man ran off and the woman survived the ordeal and was able to provide police with a description of her attacker. Her description was strikingly similar to the description of the man who had been seen with Joy just hours before her death. DNA testing confirmed that the woman's rapist had been the same man who killed Joy. Concerned that he would continue attacking women until he was caught, police ramped up their attempts to identify him, but still no one would talk. Joy's sisters have done everything possible to ensure the public doesn't forget that their sister's murderer has never been caught. They have even offered a $25,000 reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction. Nevertheless, detectives continue to believe that there are people who know who was responsible for Joy's death. Her loved one started a petition on change.org for the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolfe, to have the DNA from Joy's case analyzed by Parabon Nanolabs. Unfortunately, as of January 2023, no one has been arrested for the murder of Joy, and this case remains unsolved. Cherise Nicole Clark was born on November 19, 2001, and was described as always smiling and was said to have a great sense of humor. At the age of 15, Cherise lived with her mother, 33-year-old Joanna Clark, in Baltimore, Maryland, in the 2800 block of Round Road in the Cherry Hill neighborhood. While Cherise had a different father, her six younger siblings' father was Dennis Demo Queen, her mother's ex-boyfriend. According to their loved ones, Queen had been abusing and stalking Cherise's mother, Joanna, for years. Joanna and Queen had a long, troubled relationship and had begun dating when Cherise was just a toddler. He also treated Cherise differently than the other children and had also allegedly physically abused her. Joanna repeatedly tried to leave him and even got a restraining order against him in September 2016. Cherise deeply disliked Queen and never wanted to be in the house with him if her mother wasn't there. About a week earlier, Cherise told her mother that Queen had made sexual advances to her. Joanna told him he had to leave and said she would put all his belongings out on the street by February 4th. Because Queen could not hold a job for very long and was frequently unemployed, he would often be relied on to care for his children while their mother worked. On February 4th, 2017, Joanna was at work and Cherise was home babysitting her six younger siblings when Queen showed up. Cherise's last known communication on that day was around 2.30 p.m., and Queen said she left the children with him between 2.30 and 3 p.m. After that, she has never been seen again. Her phone pinged downtown that evening, but none of her friends saw her. In a crazy twist, Joanna would also go missing that same evening. She had been out on a date and called a friend to ask for a ride home, then called back to say she was taking the bus instead. She spoke to her friend as she arrived at her house around 11 p.m. and promised to call her again later. Since then, Joanna and Cherise have never been heard from again. Queen said he was drunk and asleep and woke up at about 11.15 p.m. when someone came in, but he couldn't remember who it was. He said when he woke up in the morning, both Joanna and Cherise were gone. Strangely, Queen never attempted to report them missing and never asked anyone if they knew where they were. A family friend filed the missing persons report three days after Joanna had missed work on February 6th and 7th and Cherise hadn't shown up to school. Also missing was $800 in cash, which Joanna had been saving for the rent. Both were usually active on social media, but since their disappearances, both accounts have gone silent. Also missing are both their cell phones, which have never been found. Joanna's other children were placed in foster care after their mother's disappearance. Queen's brother took a lie detector test, and the result was inconclusive, but Queen refused to take a test. 
The police have not named Queen or anyone else as a suspect or person of interest in their disappearances, but said they believe the women met with foul play. Sharice's grandmother said, I am aware they're gone, but you have to give them back. You got to give them back. I'm not stopping. As of January 2023, neither Sharice nor Joanna have ever been found, and their cases remain unsolved. Robert John Bornos was born on October 18, 1967, and went by the nickname Link. At the age of 25, Link and his wife were separated due to a rocky marriage. He was staying at his mother's house in Cordova, Maryland, and had begun dating another woman. On April 19, 1993, Link had been hired as a caretaker of a private property in Trap, Maryland, and went to the now-closed Chop Tank Inn in Easton, Maryland, to celebrate his new job. He played pool with some friends that evening, and shortly before 2 a.m., he ordered his final drink after the bartender announced a last call. He had been in good spirits all night, telling his friends about his new caretaker position and how much he thought he was going to enjoy the job. Link had too much to drink and was feeling sick and walked out to the parking lot to get some fresh air. He then asked the friend who drove him to the Chop Tank Inn if he could borrow his car keys so he could sit in the car. His friend tossed him the keys and said he would be out as soon as he finished his last game of pool. Link was last seen standing next to a blue car, but then vanished. Confused, his friends wondered if he had felt worse than he had let on and had grabbed a ride with someone else so he could get home sooner. About a week would go by without anyone hearing from him. Then, his family found his vehicle still parked in the parking lot of a butcher's shop seven miles from the Chop Tank Inn, where he had originally parked it the night he met up with friends. So there is no confusion here. Link parked at the butcher shop and then called a ride with a friend to the Chop Tank Inn. They tried calling Link at his mother's house, but he wasn't there. His mother, Linda, thought he might have gone to stay with his sister, but soon learned that she hadn't heard from him either. Concerned, Linda called the police and tried to report her son missing but the police noted that he was an adult and free to come and go as he pleased. It would sadly be five long years before he was officially reported missing. In 1996, a body was found not far from where Link had disappeared, but it turned out not to be him. However, it did give Linda some hope that her son was still alive. Linda's hopes were raised even further in May 1999, when a man who had lived in Cordova reported seeing Link at a restaurant in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Although he didn't speak to him, he was so certain that it had been Link that Linda decided to travel to Virginia and look for herself. She spent five days there showing Link's picture to everyone she encountered. She spoke to the manager at the restaurant where the sighting had taken place, and the manager said that Link's photograph looked very familiar. Linda walked up and down Virginia Beach's boardwalk, distributing missing person flyers and talking with local business owners, customers, tourists, and homeless people. Although several people thought they recognized Link from the photographs, there were no definite sightings. There were a few potential sightings of Link over the years, and Linda traveled all over Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina following up on potential leads about her son. In 2016, Maryland State Police took another look at the case and made a public plea for information. They stated that they believed some people close to Link at the time likely knew more than they had told the police, and they hoped they would finally do the right thing and come forward so the family could finally have some closure. Linda would unfortunately die on March 8, 2019, never finding out what happened to her son. The Maryland State Police have said since the beginning that there have been very few leads in the case, and they describe Link's disappearance as a huge mystery. However, they do believe foul play was involved and that he was likely killed the same night he went missing. As of January 2023, Link has never been found, and this case remains unsolved.
Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick was born on June 9, 1971 in Ohio. At the age of 17, Tracy was living in Frederick, Maryland and was a senior at Brunswick High School. She was a sweet, shy teenager who loved animals and always tried to rescue strays. She also liked to write poetry in her spare time and one of her poems was published in the New American Poetry Anthology when she was 16. Tracy was hoping to major in accounting at Mount St. Mary's University after graduation and even talked about going to law school. While in school, she was working two part-time jobs in the Westridge Shopping Center, including Barnett Shoes and Eileen Ladies Sportswear. On the evening of March 15, 1989, Tracy was scheduled to close Eileen's by herself that night. Her mother, Diane, stopped by her work after 6 p.m. to bring Tracy something to eat and found her alone in the store reading a book. The store closed at 9 p.m., and about 15 minutes after closing, security guard Don Barnes walked past the shop while making his routine patrol around the shopping center. Don, a deputy with the Frederick County Sheriff's Office who worked part-time as a security guard to make some extra money, noticed the lights were still on inside Eileen's when he walked by. Don made a second patrol of the shopping center around 10.40 p.m. By this time, most of the stores were dark and quiet, but when Don walked past Eileen's again, he still saw the lights on inside. He checked the front door and found it unlocked so he stepped inside and called out to see if anyone was there. He then began searching the store. When he pushed the door to the back storeroom, he found Tracy's deceased body lying on the floor. Not long after police arrived on the scene, Tracy's parents drove into the parking lot. They had grown concerned when Tracy hadn't arrived home by her normal time and thought she might have had a flat tire or some other car trouble. Tracy had also been late coming home the night before, her father, Billy, had driven to her workplace to check on her and found Tracy talking to a boy she had previously dated. Turns out the two had decided to reconcile that night, and her parents asked her to call them the next time she was going to be late. However, when they showed up on this night, they saw all the flashing lights in front of the store, panicked, and raced for the door. However, officers blocked them from entering the store and Tracy's mother frantically pleaded for them to tell her that her daughter was okay. When they broke the bad news to them, Diane collapsed and had to be taken to a nearby hospital to be treated for shock. Tracy's parents weren't the only ones shocked by her murder. The shop was not located in a place that is known for violent crimes, and investigators struggled to make sense of the crime scene. It didn't appear that robbery had been the motive, as the money in the cash register was still there. The only thing missing was Tracy's purse, which had her car keys and the store keys in it. Tracy was found with stab wounds, but was fully clothed and had not been indecently assaulted. While the killer had likely entered through the front door, investigators determined they had probably exited from the store's rear entrance. There was a blood smear on the back door and a partial fingerprint. In addition, several droplets of blood were found in a rear hallway that led to the store's loading dock and dumpster. Investigators believe it's possible that the killer was able to escape through the loading dock. Detectives found a man sitting in his car in the shopping center parking lot, waiting for his wife to finish her shift at one of the other stores. The police interviewed him, but he couldn't provide any useful information. He hadn't seen or heard anything unusual while he sat in the parking lot. The few employees still present at the shopping center were also interviewed, but none of them had noticed anything out of the ordinary that night. The medical examiner noted that it appeared to be an intensely personal crime, telling police that someone must have been extremely angry with Tracy. Tracy was known for being somewhat conservative, and some of her co-workers described her as a little old-fashioned but she was also known for being extremely responsible. For example, she bought herself a 1979 Grand Prix and hung a cardboard cutout of a teddy bear from the rearview window using money she saved from working. Investigators also interviewed Tracy's friends and classmates and couldn't find anyone who had a bad thing to say about her. She had no known enemies and never mentioned being frightened by anyone. Immediately after Tracy was killed, 
Barnett's changed their policy so that no employee would ever be scheduled to close the store alone. However, it's unclear if Eileen's did the same thing. A few weeks after the murder, the investigation seemed to be stalling because no witnesses had come forward to report seeing or hearing anything unusual on the night Tracy was killed. Detectives admitted that the lack of witnesses hindered their investigation, and with no suspects, they still had no idea what the motive was. The first big break in the case would come from a Las Vegas-based confession hotline. The 900 number was set up so people could call in, pay by the minute, and confess their deepest, darkest secrets. Then others could call in and listen to them. Shockingly, one of the callers would end up confessing to Tracy's murder. An attorney for the hotline forwarded the recording to the Las Vegas Police Department, who listened to it and then sent it to authorities in Maryland. The recording lasted for just over a minute and had been called in from a payphone located at a Safeway grocery store seven miles north of Frederick, Maryland. Interestingly, the mail caller claimed his name was Don, the same name as the security guard who discovered her body. The caller said that three months earlier, he had stabbed a girl to death. However, he said he wasn't worried about being identified because there are lots of guys named Don in Frederick. The man said the girl he had killed had worked in a ladies' sportswear store, and he often came by and talked to her when she was working alone. Then, on the night of the murder, they had gotten into an argument, which ended in him pulling out a knife and killing her. The caller noted that he knew he should turn himself into the police, but that wouldn't bring Tracy back. He decided against confessing to authorities because Maryland has the death penalty. He ended by saying he was sorry for what he did, but there was nothing he could do to take it back. Investigators who listened to the tape believed the mail caller might have actually been the killer. Hoping to open a dialogue with him, Corporal Barry Horner, the lead investigator on the case, wrote the man a letter and had it published in a local newspaper. He assured the man that if he confessed to the crime, Frederick County State's attorney Lawrence Dorsey would take the death penalty off the table. He ended by saying he hoped the man would do the right thing and confess so that Tracy's family would finally gain some closure. The mysterious caller was unmoved by the letter, as he never attempted to contact law enforcement or make any other calls to the confession hotline. However, investigators still believed the call was a viable lead, so they decided to release it to the public on the one-year anniversary of the murder. Four Frederick area radio stations were given copies of the confession tape and asked to play them on March 15, 1990. Detectives were hopeful that someone in the area would recognize the caller's voice, and so they asked anyone who thought they could identify the man to contact investigators. Two hours after the call was aired, a listener contacted the police and told them they were certain they knew who the man was. The name they provided to police was someone they had already considered a potential person of interest, though they had never been deemed a strong suspect. Detectives attempted to interview the man, but he declined to cooperate. At 1 a.m. on March 16, 1990, deputies returned to the man's home armed with a search warrant. In addition to seizing several items from the man's house, they also obtained a hair sample from the man. However, since the man had not been charged with a crime yet, they refused to release the man's name to the public. Officials also reminded reporters that even if the man had made the phone call to the confession hotline, it didn't necessarily mean he was the killer. They needed physical evidence to back up his claim. After the crime lab analyzed the evidence obtained during the search, officials announced that they could not link the man to Tracy's murder. The man remained on their radar for a while. But detectives eventually determined that the call had been a hoax and the man had no involvement in the crime. Investigators have resubmitted some of the physical evidence for more advanced DNA testing, but have been unsuccessful in extracting a DNA profile for the suspect. On October 24, 1989, Martha Woodworth, a Massachusetts woman with a reputation as a psychic, began to receive calls from a young man who identified himself as Sean. He seemed obsessed with finding the person who had murdered Tracy. Martha told him that she needed more information before she could help. Eventually, he agreed to send her newspaper clippings. 
However, when she received the envelope with his handwriting on the outside, she felt that his involvement in the case was much stronger than he let on. She also found the handwriting extremely disturbing, so she felt it was her responsibility to alert the police that she had discovered a potential suspect. Chief Richard Ashton played the confession tape for Martha over the phone. She believed the voice was Sean's and that Don and Sean were the same men. She maintained contact with Sean for some time while police checked out the return address on his envelope. The address was Walkersville, Maryland, the same town where the calling confession had been made from. However, the young man living at the address was not named Sean or Don. In 1993, Corporal Robert Servicek took over the investigation into Tracy's murder. In March 1994, he stated that they had identified a prime suspect in the case. At the time of the murder, the suspect was living in Frederick with his family. He also knew Tracy and had previously worked with her. Reportedly, the man had read too much into his relationship with Tracy, who only thought of him as a friend. So the detective believed the motive for the murder was jealousy, anger, and revenge. Servicek was convinced that he had the right guy based on a large amount of circumstantial evidence against him. In May 1994, a grand jury convened to hear the evidence against the suspect. Forty-six witnesses later, the grand jury voted to indict him. However, the deputy state's attorney declined to prosecute him because she didn't believe they could actually get a conviction. Servicek later claimed that political and personal agendas and people not doing their jobs were what really prevented the man from being arrested. In 2009, police said that two of the suspects that developed over the years still remain viable to this day. One of those suspected was the man indicted by the grand jury in 1994. But the police admit they don't have enough evidence to charge anyone. Samples of evidence found at the scene have been submitted several times in an attempt to obtain a DNA profile, but have been unsuccessful. One of the potential suspects is believed to be Don Barnes Jr., the security guard that found her body. His daughter allegedly claimed that he was abusive toward her and her mother. She also believes that he was involved in Tracy's murder and said he had over an hour to cover up the crime. His father was the police chief at the time of her murder, and some have suggested that he covered up evidence in this case. However, this has never been confirmed. As of January 2023, no one has ever been arrested for the murder of Tracy, and this case remains unsolved. Dana Von D. Chisholm was born in August 1969 and grew up in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Growing up, Dana was a cheerleader and sang in her school's chorus. She later began studying business at King's College in Charlotte, North Carolina, and graduated in 1993. Dana dreamed of becoming a professional singer, and her father said she sounded just like Whitney Houston. After college, Dana moved to Washington, D.C., hoping for a more exciting life. She moved into the basement apartment of a very nice, single-family home on Argyle Terrace Northwest in a secluded section of the upscale Crestwood neighborhood just outside of Rock Creek Park. The landlord of the apartment lived in the upstairs house with her teenage son. At the age of 25, Dana was working as a secretary at the Hudson Institute and had been in D.C. for about 18 months. Her boss described Dana as an intelligent, bright young woman with a big smile, but said there were lots of red flags because she often showed up late and upset or sometimes didn't show up at all. On February 27, 1995, her parents received a strange phone call at 1 in the morning. The caller identified themselves as Lieutenant Lewis Douglas with the Washington, D.C. Police Department and informed them their daughter Dana had been arrested for prostitution. The man claimed that Dana was arrested during a sting operation at the Omni Hotel and said she would likely be released the next day. Her father, Johnny, said the man's tone didn't sound appropriate for a police officer delivering such bad news. So the Chisholms called the man back later that day using the phone number he had given them. 
Officer Lewis Douglas answered, but he was different from the man they had spoken to earlier that morning. After being told that Dana was never arrested in a sting operation, a confused Johnny asked the officer to do a welfare check on her. Officer Douglas stopped by Dana's apartment and knocked on the door, but no one answered. He left his business card on her door and on her car and then left. Johnny also called Dana's work, but her boss rudely hung up on him after telling him she wasn't there. On Monday morning, 17 hours after Dana's parents received the call from an alleged police officer, Dana's landlord, Cynthia Ford, was contacted by the Hudson Institute, saying that Dana had failed to show up for work. Also, one of her co-workers and close friends had been unable to reach her since Friday. Dana told them she wasn't feeling too well and would be spending the weekend at home, but when they called to check on her, she never answered any of their phone calls. Concerned, Dana's office manager asked Cynthia to check on her. At 7 p.m., Dana's unclothed body was found in the hallway of her basement apartment, and her manner of death was from strangulation. The police found the apartment ransacked, and there was a handwritten note on the door, I'll be back, MPD, Metro Police Department. Authorities believe it was from Dana's killer, the same man who claimed to be Lieutenant Lewis Douglas. A couple of weeks earlier, Dana's co-worker found her crying at her desk, and when she asked Dana what was wrong, she told her she was pregnant. Dana told that same friend that she had planned on visiting her parents on February 24th to tell them the news. Dana's parents also confirmed that Dana had plans to visit them and was supposed to share some big news. And an autopsy confirmed she had been four weeks pregnant at the time of her death. The last time Dana spoke to her parents was when her father called her at work on the 14th to thank her for a Valentine's Day card and money she had sent them. When investigators traced the phone call from the alleged Lieutenant Lewis Douglas, it was traced to a payphone on 4th Street and Massachusetts Avenue, a few blocks from D.C. Police Headquarters. Dana had actually met with the real Officer Douglas weeks before her death to report that her TV had been stolen. Authorities believe that's when Douglas gave her his business card, and they believe the killer found that business card in Dana's apartment and decided to assume the officer's identity. Interestingly, the Chisholms never heard from Officer Douglas again, and in 2011, the Washington Post asked to speak with him about the case, but the D.C. Police Department wouldn't allow it. Investigators looked into Dana's personal life and interviewed several acquaintances and searched her apartment, scouring her diaries and computer. In a shocking twist, they would discover that Dana was actually living a secret life. She was answering personal ads from the newspaper and running her own dating ads. She would meet these men, have sex with them, and then allegedly demand and blackmail them to help her out with rent. It also appeared these were not one-off encounters. Dana had actually kept records of all the men she had been with, including their phone numbers and the places they worked. Investigators discovered that most of the men were married businessmen in their 50s who lived in the outer suburbs. The evening her body was discovered, a TV reporter found a key to Dana's apartment down the road from her house. Some believe that the key was the spare that she kept hidden outside her apartment. During the investigation, the lead detective received a strange phone call from a man with a raspy voice. The first few phone calls, the man called the D.C. Police Homicide Branch looking for the lead detective, Sergeant Farish, but he was out each time. The man also left messages indicating that Farish should call him back, but never left a callback number. Then, a few weeks after the first call, the man happened to call while Farish was at his desk and said he wanted to talk about Dana. He said Dana was dead because of her lifestyle, which he said consisted of nightclubs, alcohol, and promiscuous sex. The caller said he wanted Farish to share those details with reporters that were covering the murder. The caller was so adamant that Farish did the exact opposite and fed a story to reporters about Dana being a naive young woman. He did this hoping it would draw out the killer. The caller was now angry at Farish, and over the next two months, the man called twice more, and both conversations were short and testy, and then the man asked to meet Farish in person. 
With the hope this might spark a new lead in the case, the officer went to the location and waited a few hours. However, the caller never showed up and never called again, and the case went cold. As of January 2023, no one has ever been arrested for the murder of Dana, and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>